As we delve deeper into our journey through ancient Rome, some might say it is imperative to speak of the Battle of Lake Regillus. Whilst accounts are sketchy about the skirmish, it does give us a better idea of where Rome was heading, as well as giving us some closure in the fallout after the collapse of the monarch and the rise of the Republic. Indeed, for those of you who have been paying attention, you will know that the douchiest king in Roman history, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, did not take to being dethroned sitting down. He made several attempts to get back at the consuls who had taken his place, and would end up forming his own factions with the Etruscan neighbours as well as the Latin League. The Latin League was a confederation of several Latin towns and settlements that were laid out near Rome. Originally, they had been established to protect against the raids made by the enemies around them, but during Superbus's rule, they would be forced to acknowledge Roman dominance and have no choice but to join their forces with the ever-growing Juggernaut. It was Superbus who had enforced this treaty, and it appears that it was him who they swore fealty to, and not the Republic that now controlled Rome. By this point in the 5th century, Superbus was an elderly man. He didn't have much left to live for, and probably wanted to die knowing he had crushed the city that had cast him out. Or perhaps he meant to take it back, and give it to his son Titus, for then there would have been an 8th king of Rome, and the Tarquinius name would have been preserved, maybe plunging the entire Mediterranean onto a darker path. The elderly Superbus had also joined forces with his son-in-law, Octavius Mamilius, the dictator of the ancient Roman city of Tusculum. In essence, despite being an elderly man who'd been exiled and stripped of much of his resources, Superbus still managed to assemble a formidable force of men to march upon Rome. The tensions amongst the Senate were high during this time, and a great sense of unease would have shrouded the Roman political structure, as well as daily life. Both patricians and plebeians alike would have no doubt been in constant fear of war and decimation, not to mention the memory of Superbus's awful rule was still very fresh in their minds. The thought of him coming back in any capacity, let alone defeating the army and taking back his throne, would have surely set some into certain anxiety. With this in mind, the Senate appointed a former consul in Aulus Postimius Albus as a dictator. His task was simple, destroy Superbus once and for all. Sources differ as to exactly when the Battle of Lake Regillus took place. Roman historian Livy suggests it took place in 499 BC, but also concedes that it could have taken place in 496 BC, given that his sources did not coincide with one another. Many modern historians also debate as to when the battle took place, but it is generally agreed that it took place sometime in the final 10 years of the 5th century, and was a decisive victory for the Romans. The lake itself, this Lake Regillus as it was known, was appropriately situated in a volcanic crater, quite the setting for what was going to be a bloody battle. The lake itself has since been drained, some many hundred years after the battle, and to gaze upon it now, one would never have guessed that such a flow of water had been there, let alone fought upon so robustly. Despite having the stronghold of Rome itself, Rome wasn't going into this battle with the utmost confidence. As mentioned, Superbus had not only the force of the Latin League at his back, but also the forces of his son-in-law, Octavius Mamilius. But rumour had it, again according to Levy, that the Volsci, a dangerous tribe that was well acquainted with raiding Rome, had thrown in with Superbus and offered him a considerable number of troops to aid in his conquest. But perhaps this worked against Superbus in the end, because when Albus learned of these potential forces joining in on the fray, it spurred him on to engage Superbus before the tribe could arrive. Due to his lack of hesitation, and what some might have called a hasty attack, the Volscian forces did not show up on time. Albus led the Roman infantry along with Titus Abutius Helva, who led the cavalry. Interestingly, Helva had been the consul before Albus' appointment as dictator, and it was the dictator's job to pick a master of the horse, or a magister equitum, he who of course led the men on horseback. The magister equitum also served as the dictator's lieutenant. Upon reaching the battlefield, the Romans would learn that Superbus himself was present on the battlefield, 
and had been accompanied by his last remaining son, Titus. Where the Romans may have been nervy at the prospect of fighting such a formidable force, their fears were shunted and replaced with a fiery passion to claim the lives of Superbus and his son, thus ending their accursed bloodline. In fact, it is understood that once everyone knew that Superbus was about, they showed more heart than in any other battle. You have to wonder what Superbus was thinking as he rode onto the battlefield. As mentioned, he was an old man, and wasn't going to be of much aid in the thick of things. Perhaps it was his desire for vengeance which saw him join the battle, but more so it was likely a hatred for Rome, for he didn't hold back in attacking Albus. In his old age though, he was fended off with relative ease, and actually suffered an injury in this encounter. Meanwhile, the master of the horse, Helva, attacked Octavius Mamilius, both of whom suffered grievous wounds for their efforts. In fact, Helva had been wounded so badly that he was forced to retreat from the battle and had to go about commanding his men from a distance. It wouldn't have done well for the morale of the Magister Equitum to be injured, much less rendered to the sidelines of the battle, where his commands would need to be ferried back and forth by messengers. This had a toll on the Romans, for it soon saw them becoming overwhelmed by the sheer number put forth by Superbus. In fact, an even greater setback was sustained when Marcus Valerius Volusus, a former consul, was killed as he tried to attack Titus Tarquinius. But during his charge, he was apprehended by Titus's guards and drilled straight through the chest with a spear. If it wasn't for the quick thinking of Albus, who brought forth men from his own bodyguard to fill the ranks of the army, the battle might have been lost. Meanwhile, the great hero Titus Herminius Aquilinus, who you might remember had famously defended the Sublucian Bridge, was able to kill Superbus' son-in-law, Octavius Mamilius. However, his glory was short-lived, for as he was looting Octavius' body, he was impaled by a javelin. With the battlefield looking like a complete mess, it was hard to determine who was winning. There may very well have been a complete lack of control from either side, as the landscape descended into chaos. In any case, Albus had to make do with the fact that Helva wasn't going to be able to do his job properly, now that he'd been injured. He therefore took both the infantry and the cavalry under his command, and ordered the riders to dismount, join the infantry, and make one final unified push on the Latin forces. With this mess of men storming towards them, the Latins retreated, and given the ferocity of the charge, Superbus had no choice but to abandon the field. It would be the last time he tried to take Rome again. A popular legend which comes out from this battle is that of Castor and Pollux. The heroes from Greek and Roman mythology were actually present in the battle, although very young, and fighting on the side of the Romans. With descendants of the gods on their side, it is no wonder they stood victorious. In fact, having noted their valour in battle, Albus would order a temple to be built in their honour, after returning home to Rome and reveling in celebration. Not only was Albus able to lead the Romans to victory, but he was able to crush the final resistance of the wicked king Superbus, and halted the Tarquinius legacy and name from ever spoiling Rome again. In the next video, we'll be looking at the Battle of Mount Algildus, which saw the Romans enter a battle against the Italic tribe known as the Equae, one they were sure to lose, if not for the command of the dictator Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus, who demonstrated the peculiar Roman knack for turning the tide of a battle in their favour. Let me know what you thought about today's video in the comments below, and as always, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time guys.